Our first keynote speaker, Chang Kim, is an Intel Fellow and the CTO of applications at Barefoot Division of Intel. P4 community knows him really well as he has been involved in P4 for over six years. Chang, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sadaf. Hi, I'm Chang Kim. Um, thank you very much for joining this virtual event um, at this really challenging time for all of us. And I really appreciate uh, for the people who arranged this opportunity and events and also people who joined here. I'm Chang. Um, uh, I'm working as CTO of Vectrix Division in Intel. So today I'm going to talk about the future of programmable packet processing and, and uh, our part in making networks better. Um, so let's start with a, a simple, really simple question here. So we're, we're here, 2020. Um, I'd like to make some very cautious prediction about what's going to happen uh, in the next 10 years. So let's see how we're going to see networking or the networking industry is going to work in about 10 years from now. Um, this COVID situation, uh, although there are a lot of bad news in general, but one very positive message for our industry in particular is that networking is going to play an even more critical role going forward this, in this post-COVID world. And there's no doubt about that. I mean, it's really critical. Uh, but we want to also know how this is going to evolve. Right? So that's the, uh, one of the topics that I want to discuss here in my webinar. Uh, but to understand or to, to be able to you know, predict what's going to happen in the future, it may be actually worth looking back as well. So let's see what happened about 10 years ago. So about 10 years ago, around 2010, a lot of networking systems were built in closed and proprietary fashion, right? Like all these compute machines and network mainframes were built from you know, ground to all the way up to the software and applications. Everything was built in. Those were great engineering artifacts, but over time, people realized that it's really hard to evolve and enhance those systems. And so uh, to, to share a few evidences of uh, the situation, this shows the uh, number of RFCs published by IETF over several decades. And then you can see that the number of those increased significantly. At some point, it was super linear and then uh, it continued that way. And this proliferation of so-called standards were, you know, in a sense, it, it appeared to be a sort of uh, an evidence of innovation, but at the same time, it worked as barriers of entries. And the reason is because all these RFCs were written in human languages, and hence it left significant room for interpretation. And then that, you know, ambiguity actually worked better for incumbent big vendors and so they all actually use these kind of uh, opportunities to create bigger and higher barriers to protect their own investment. And then network users and big network owners felt that they were actually stranglehold by the vendors. And then um, a lot of interesting movements started, right? We started seeing the disaggregation effort, software defined networking, network function virtualization, programmable forwarding telemetry, and and also open source was one you know, pivotal foundation of all these things. So what do all these innovations that happened last 10 years mean? It basically means that we really wanted to give the network owners more control of their network and especially in particular their software. And, and the reason we started with their software or control plane is because that's naturally easier to get their handles on because it's written in pure software and then it runs on general purpose CPU machines and so on. So switch control plane um, and end host networking stack and end host networking control plane, those things are uh, or have gone through this uh, sort of hand, you know, change of hands and then they're almost now owned by the network owners. And then about two or three years ago, we started observing the next movement, right? Network owners now wanted to take control of their data plane or packet processing plane as well. So that's what we call part two of this big transition. And then we expect that this will continue at full steam and, and, and going forward. 
And then um, I wanted to share with you why we believe that this part one and part two, this big one two punches, will uh, change the industry in a significant fashion. And then I want to share with you why this is happening now. Okay. So let me start with our personal experiences at Barefoot at Intel, and then I'll talk about industry wide uh, observations too. So at Barefoot at Intel, we've been spending almost six years to pr fully programmable packet processing technologies. And then we observed that this high speed but fully programmable switching chips can have the same power, performance, and cost as fixed function switches. Okay. And then over time, you know, we realized that fixed function switches are also being diversified from you know, more powerful and more feature rich uh, product line to you know, linear but you know, higher speeds and fees product line and deep buffer versus short buffer. We'll observe similar kind of sort of semi -diverse diversification within the programmable switch product line as well. But overall, given the same amount of flexibility and speed, feed, speed and fees, we believe that this trend will continue the same way, meaning that programmable switches are now capable of delivering the same functionality and performance and latency at the same you know, uh, cost as fixed function chips. What this means is that now beautiful new ideas that people wanted to realize can be done by the programmers hired by the network owners rather than the chip designers. And, and this means absolutely more innovations because the users know what they want, exactly how they want to do, and that they can actually realize those things on their own. Okay. But really, we need to confirm that this is true, right? How do we know if programmable switch chip has the same power, performance, and cost as fixed function switching counterpart? And then here is one um, such evidence that we have collected. So here's you know, a simple table comparing between two uh, types of high-speed switching chips, fully programmable Topino, um, people programmable one, and fixed function ASIC, uh, developed uh, roughly at the same time about three years ago. Uh, they're delivering the same total throughput, 6.4 terabps. I don't wanna go through each line, but I just wanted to highlight a few things. As you can see, programmable ASIC, in this particular generation happens to be able to deliver higher throughput at lower power and more functionalities. So this is an you know, existential evidence that programmable chips can actually match the fixed function chips uh, power and performance and cost characteristics without sacrificing the, the, the programmability at all. But as I said, this, this happens to be just our own personal experience at Barefoot and Intel. But really, for the last two, three years, across the whole industry, a lot of other advances happened in the, in the field of programmable packet processing. Starting with high-speed programmable switching ASICs, there are at least three major vendors developing or who have already delivered fully programmable or semi-programmable high-speed networking ASICs. Although they're using slightly different programming models, but at a high level, if you squint enough, they all look like P4, okay? Um, several types of smart NICs, okay? Uh, every major networking solution vendor has developed their own smart NICs, and then a few MSDCs went even further and they developed their own smart NICs for their own consumption. And then there are several new startups in this, in this field we're also joining this uh, extreme of uh, innovations. Okay. High-speed software-based packet processing, OVS, DPDK, EVPF in Linux kernel, BPP, all these things are not, it's, it's way beyond just concept states. These are actually proven technologies that are used in production at large scale by many, many players, not just MSDCs, but even enterprises and telcos as well. And all these things about the three of these things are actually deployed at scale. These high-speed fully programmable switching ASICs are adopted by several MSDCs and carriers, not just for regular top of rack switches or spines for their data centers, but for edge devices and special purpose gateways. Any, anywhere you need more functionality and more customization, 
they have already started using these devices by programming them directly uh, through their you know, development teams. Packet level data plane telemetry, for example, in-band network telemetry, INT, is one of the hottest technologies developed and deployed today. And then without such fine-grained visibility into what is happening into, in, in your network, it's almost impossible these days to even productize or sell uh, modern, modern networking solutions. And then, um, because this data plane um, programmability and flexibility enables users to introduce new features working at full data plane speed, basically at the real you know, minimum uh, RTT level, say tens of nanos, you know, a microseconds or hundreds of microseconds within data centers, they are now realizing that you know, real time or almost pseudo real time closed loop, closed loop control systems are now realizable. And, and I'm going to share with you a few examples of those innovative ideas. So all these things indicate that programmable packet processing is becoming the mainstream now. And this will continue, as I said, at full speed going forward. So this is why I believe that by two, uh, 2030, about 10 years from now, NICs, switches, virtual switches, and those networking stacks will have been fully programmable for more than seven years. Okay. Then what does that mean? Now, the network owners, or we as the whole industry, um, will think of a network as a programmable platform. And, and the behavior is going to be described at the top in, in a declarative manner. And then each of these desired behaviors are going to be partitioned, compiled, validated and verified and run across the entire elements through the automation systems that are adopting you know, uh, programming language technologies. So every data center will work differently because now they can, they, they, are, they will be able to afford that kind of differentiation and customization very easily, right? I mean, it's exactly the same analogy. If you go to say, you know, Google Cloud, Amazon Cloud, Microsoft Cloud, at a really high level, they all look like cloud systems, but the underlying infrastructure software is, of course, completely different than it's written by them. Can you even think of a large hyperscaler running their service using someone else's binary? Just impossible. And network will not be this, an exception to that as well. They will customize their networking infrastructure from the data plane all the way to the control plane on their own. And therefore, every data center will work differently and program tailored locally. So for example, routing can, in 10 years, it will be almost fully source routed. And then that source routing can be done in a topology aware, adaptive fashion by mainly end hosts and their logically centralized control plans. Congestion control, there are many ways of doing, you know, or solving this tough congestion control problem. But one thing people realize that if you have very good visibility into what's happening exactly at the congestion point, such as, you know, exact queue depth or the available link bandwidth, you can actually introduce really uh, high performance solutions here at a low cost. So these things will continue. So here I just wanted to capture one big um, you know, uh, vision for the, uh, the programmable network platform. So network owners and operators will use fine-grained measurement and PL programming language and machine learning technologies to automate network control at scale. And so let's just try to visualize uh, this kind of um, you know, architecture, okay? So in your network, you have many switches in the hub and then senders and receivers and then the uh, control plane, sometimes decentralized or sometimes logically centralized. But all these actors in this scene will be, will, or will have, you know, been made uh, programmable already. So we'll see, you know, P4 switch in the data plane, and then uh, P4 programmable NICs in variable in, in various formats at the end host. The if you happen to have some virtual switching, you could have something like P4 OVS or just P4 programmable virtual switching platform. And then uh, 
in, in, in each switch, you also have switch operating system, either thin OS or thick OS, but all these control planes will expose P4 defined uh, interface. And then if you look at the uh, end host itself, sometimes you will see user space um, networking applications written in say people programmable DPDK or VPP. And then the kernel, uh, if you actually happen to use kernel rather than user space, you know, you'll again see people programmable eBPF or the next generation eBPF solutions. Put all these things together, and then running your network, you will be able to collect a huge amount of high quality, fine grain per packet measurement. And then this data is now into the inference, training, generation, validation, logic, or engines, which will again generate the control plane code or the control plane configuration, the contract between the control plane and the data plane, and even sometimes new data plane code as well. So this is the high level framework through which we will um, manage and control big networks in about 10 years. Now switching the gear a little bit, uh, as Intel, we also want to uh, be a big contributor to this stream. So we are going to contribute in, on three big avenues. We will create first uh, more targets. People are switching ASICs, uh, but We'll also continue uh, innovations to deliver P4 programmable NICs, P4 programmable smart NICs, P4 programmable FPGAs, and P4 programmable packet processing software as well. And then we could even come up with hybrid targets. And by hybrid targets, I mean a target that is comprised of multiple of these things. For example, switching ASICs and smart NICs together, or switching ASICs and FPGAs together. But this thing can be actually abstracted into one virtual target because P4 architecture uh, target architecture um, model actually allows us to abstract such physical hardware into a logical hardware. So that's what we're going to continue. We'll also create more software and then contribute uh, a, you know, a huge chunk of this through the open source community. So compilation, verification, validation, debugging, and testing and profiling tools, uh, runtime APIs and libraries that can uh, be adapted to support P4 style programming models and so on. Lastly, we'll also continue to develop more applications of these programmable data planes and programmable control plane together, and then across the entire networking um, uh, systems, end to end, right? end host, NICs, smart NICs, switches all together. So for example, we'll, we'll work to deliver end-to-end -end data plane telemetry because switch alone can give you a significant amount of visibility, but imagine that NICs and smart NICs and endos networking stack can give the same kind of visibility as INT today. How beautiful and how easy it'll be debugging your you know, applications and distributed systems with such data. And the host and NIC applications as well. For example, virtual switching, congestion control, message processing applications. We'll keep delivering those kind of applications. Um, and, and eventually we'll also try to offload some of the compute and storage workloads on this uh, acceleration engine, such as stream processing. Uh, as long as these are IO bound, we believe that programmable data planes can actually uh, help significantly. So I just wanted to share with you um, one uh, big picture and then a few examples of this thing uh, before I wrap up my talk. So the graphics industry has gone through these innovations already. And then we all know that maybe about 20 years ago when uh, NVIDIA came up with GPGPU, they started with accelerating you know, gaming and professional graphics apps, 2D, 3D, and basic graphics. And then people soon realized that, oh, this new machine, it's a fungible and it's low cost programmable machine. And I, I can actually write different types of applications beyond just regular graphics. So HPC, virtual reality, AR, these things have started. And then more innovations continued. Right? At this point, GPUs are more like machine learning machines rather than graphics machines. And self-driving vehicles are also using these machines a lot. If you had asked, 
the CTO of NVIDIA 20 years ago, whether he would have predicted or he or she would have predicted this? Absolutely no, they didn't know and, and they didn't intend. But once you deliver this kind of programmable, fungible machines, and then once you give the right programming model and languages, the market and the people will just make this happen naturally. And then we're, we will observe similar kind of trend with our you know, programmable data plane machines, switching chips, AC, uh, NIC chips, and other types of uh, solutions with P4, we'll start a lot of innovations. Today, we're at this stage, right? basically switching for different types of networks and some advanced congestion control and end-to-end -end telemetry and, and analytics. But soon, people will realize that we can do more. And this is also at the early stage right now happening, say, you know, various types of um, NFB machines or gateway functions are now being accelerated through these uh, programmable data plane technologies. And then people will also realize that, oh, some computing or storage related applications can actually be accelerated through this uh, trend. So inline crypto, DNS caching, key value caching and replication, extremely accurate time sync, pattern matching or stream processing, some payload processing applications, consensus protocol accelerations, and so on. And then eventually we'll, we'll see these machines working as intelligent interconnect for machine learning workers and other types of workers, storage and memory workers, and so on. So let me share with you a couple uh, specific examples. So HPCC is an INT-based high-precision congestion control developed and deployed by Alibaba and their collaborators. And it uses INT as explicit and precise feedback mechanism. Okay. So, for example, um, here is a network where you have sender and receiver and then multiple INT-capable switch ops. And then in the future, of course, you could have INT-capable NICs as well. And then while packets are being forwarded, they work as their own load packet. So switches actually add the precise congestion information, such as queue depth, queuing latency, or if there is no queue, it actually adds available link bandwidth into the packets. And then when this packet arrives at receiver, the, the, the collected INT information is sent back to the sender through an ACK mechanism. And then HPCC just keeps using this high quality congestion information to uh, adjust the rate, sender's transmission rate per every ACK. Okay. And then the result is beautiful because now you have really precise information about the congestion point at very fine time grain scale. You can actually employ MIMD, which is which was unthinkable when you were doing TCP like congestion control, right? You all heard about AIMD, additive increase and multiplicative decrease, because when you increase, you have to be very, very conservative. That's why they do AI. In this HPCC world, they can actually do multiple multiplicative increase because you know exactly how much more each sender can actually generate without causing congestion. So that actually gives you really high you know, throughput and fast convergence. And it also gives nearly zero Q because when there is no congestion, it knows exactly the available link bandwidth. So you know how much you have to additionally generate without creating Q. Okay. And then it also has very few parameters unlike any other modern uh, congestion control protocols. Controlling and deriving the right parameters for this protocol is very easy. So the net result, you can see two, two you know, summarized uh, graphs here. The latency of HPCC versus DCQCN. DCQCN is the de facto RDMA uh, congestion control protocol. HPCC gives you like almost 4x lower latency, end to end latency, uh, compared to DCQCN, which is the uh, status quo. Um, this, this shows the uh, flow completion time, basically how you know, uh, the throughput, the effective throughput has been increased when you have a lot of flows competing against the con shared congestion point. And then again, compared to other existing solutions such as DCTCP, DCQCN, and timely, HEPCC significantly outperforms them. And why do I mention this? Because this is a really beautiful example of using both smart switches and smart NICs together. And then this combination leads to innovations. 
Next example, you might have probably heard about this system called NetCache. It's really a simple front-end read-only key-value caching system. Okay. So let me, let me briefly talk about the problem first. So you have key-value server system like Redis pools or memcached pools built with x86 servers. Then there are lots of clients. And then the, the gets and puts arrive at the servers. And then because these keys are partitioned based on some static hashing like mechanisms, naturally some keys are extremely more popular than other keys. And then what you observe is that some small number of servers get overutilized first. And then these servers actually dictate the tail latency, which matters a lot. So given a, uh, a, a fixed tail latency budget, your total throughput is now bound by this single server. So that's why your effective throughput goes down significantly. To solve this kind of uh, problem, what some people did is introducing a, an extremely fast uh, front-end KV cache, where um, in the data plane, you have very small key value cache and then query statistics logic developed uh, in P4 and, and hence runnable on P4 programmable high-speed switching ASIC such as Topino. And then in the control plane, you run some simple cache management uh, logic to be able to realize your own cache replacement uh, algorithms. This simple system is giving you a remarkable improvement because it can actually, just by caching a small number of hot entries only, it can actually drive all the server's utilization almost uniformly. And then there is a lot of really beautiful theory behind this, but I'm not going to go there. But I just let me just show you the, the, the result test result here. Without this kind of uh, high performance uh, key value cache, read only cache, as I said, um, although when you have uniform popularity of all the keys, your aggregate throughput here is pretty high in this, in this bar, more than 1 billion queries per second. But as you introduce more realistic, um, Query, pop, uh, query distributions where some keys are more popular than others, the effective throughput goes down. This is what happens without this KV system or cache system. Now, once you introduce this Topino-based key value system, you can see that the, the total throughput actually goes up. And the reason is because all the servers, this blue portion, are uniformly utilized. So the aggregate throughput of the servers remains the same, irrespective of the key, you know, key's popularity. But on top of that, the, the, the best cache system, the Topino system can handle even more workloads. That's, so that's why you can get almost one order of magnitude higher throughput. And why do I mention this? Uh, and the reason is because imagine that you have this Topino based cache here. Now what's the next natural evolution to this? Right? In each of these server, if you magnify this, you actually have many cores. Then you have exactly the same problem. If you don't introduce a really good caching system, you have to bear with once or a few small number of cores overloaded when other cores are not utilized at all. So you would have had to deal with the same you know, uh, load imbalance problems. Now by introducing a small but very fast KB cache at the NIC or smart NIC, you can solve this problem very easily and then you can utilize all the cores very easily without you know, introducing a complicated uh, software-based solution. Okay. So this is again a beautiful example of combined switching architecture that leads to innovations. And then one final example. So um, you, you, of course, we're living in the world of machine learning, especially deep neural networking uh, era. And then what we realize is that the, the machine learning workers, such as uh, GPUs or purpose-built AI machines like TPUs, uh, they get faster very quickly over time. So here in this graph, we show that, hey, as you introduce more powerful GPUs, the total time that it takes to run certain um, training workload, such as ResNet 269, gets reduced. So that's this orange bar. But you realize that the amount of time that is actually spent by the workers for real training is actually going down even more fast. So the gap between this orange and blue bar is basically showing the overhead introduced by poor networking. So we can see that, hey, over time, 
the networking bottleneck is going to dominate the total training time. And this is the problem that we want to address. And then some people, again, with some smart ideas, came up with this nice solution called SwitchML. Basically, when you have many, many workers, although in this picture we're showing only two, the, the workers generate their newly generated uh, um, weight updates, shown as these uh, squares. Without this kind of powerful switch, they actually had to do n square or n logon communication so that at each iteration, at the end of each iteration, workers can actually share all the weight updates one another and then use this new average updates to go into the next, next iteration. So this is a, an extremely demanding networking workload. But imagine that the switch or, or a, a dedicated system built out of this you know, Topino-like high-speed people programmable system you can actually introduce this kind of logic. Basically, worker two introduces its own weights, worker one introduces its own weight, but the switching system that interconnects between these two actually aggregates them together and then sends out only the result, the final result. So from each worker's point of view, its networking workload becomes now uh, just linear. Okay. So this turns actually n square problem into just n problem, that's why this system actually works really, really well. And then the reason I mentioned this in, in my talk is because again, when you realize this kind of system, there is a really good division between switching system and the, and, and the networking subsystem on the worker side. For example, switches are responsible for just integer vector additions and counting and comparing this, you know, uh, the, 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 the slots, the weight update slots. But on the NIC side, you also need to do something simple, but at high performance, such as you know, chunking up these uh, weight vectors or quantizing or scaling these values because switches cannot do floating point operations, but NICs can easily translate 16-bit you know, floating point into 32-bit fixed point integers and so on. And detecting and recovering from packet drops, so you, between NICs and switches, you can introduce fairly simple, reliable protocol without congestion control your lightweight version of TCP, for example. So this is a good division of labor between smart switches and smart NICs. And the net result, again, is remarkably uh, good. So for example, switch ML can actually speed up the DNN uh, training jobs by uh, at the lowest uh, about 20% and at the highest about 300% compared to the um, status quo um, and the, the, the de facto uh, learning system and the, and the networking stack for that, which is uh, nickel. Okay. So again, this is the summary of combined switch NIC architecture uh, that leads to the innovations. So that's all I prepared today. And then uh, hopefully I have shared with you why I believe uh, this programmable packet processing will give more power to the network owners, uh, both control plane and data plane. And then given this more power and flexibility, network owners will inevitably lead lots of beautiful innovations for their networks. So let me wrap up here and then uh, receive some questions. Okay, so I opened up my Q&A window. Um, okay, the first question. So who are the three major switching ASIC vendors who developed the programmable high-speed networking ASICs? Um, those are you know, the, the, the typical ones, Intel, uh, Broadcom, and I believe Mellanox also has somewhat configurable or programmable uh, switching ASICs. Next question. Um, so next question by uh, Human Muhajeri. Um, he asked whether I'm aware of any approach to allow P4 implementation on ASICs coexist with FPGAs in one solution to enable features that vanilla P4 doesn't provide using FPGAs to be able to run more complex programs at line weight. Yes, I'm aware of a few such projects or companies who are working on this kind of thing. 
uh, at Intel, we're also working on similar projects. Um, FPGAs can, by definition, do a lot of things, but um, we're, we're, it's not like that people can be used, useful to do something really uh, non-networking thing. So a lot of these excuse me, uh, applications of this combined system comprised of both a high-speed switching ASIC and FPGAs will initially focus on uh, networking applications such as a uh, very large table or a very large packet buffer and so on. So the next question by Grayson, will your open software platform, or I'm not sure whether this is open software or open switching platform, because he said SW, will your open SW platform be available for other merchant market ASICs or just barefoot slash Intel? For example, will there be support for Cisco's new ASIC they're putting into the marketplace? Um, actually, I, I'm not the right person to answer this. By the way, I, I just realized this. Um, Cisco also publicly announced their new high-speed switching ASICs that are fully programmable in four. Sorry, I should have mentioned that as well. So it's not just three, it's three plus one. Um, but whether Cisco is going to sell those chips as uh, merchant silicon or not, I'm, I'm not able to answer that question. But that's a really good point. So it's not three, it's four <laughs> at least. So maybe I'll take one or two more questions and then hand this session over to VPN. So next question, uh, by the way, at the end of VPN's session, we'll also be able to answer some of these questions together. So next question by Nilufar. Uh, regarding collecting measurements from switches and NICs, what kind of measurements and statistics can be fed to the AI ML engine in order to find the optimal configuration and the suitable pipeline? Well, it's it's the beauty of programmable data plane is that you don't need to predefine those feature sets. And in my opinion, the real value of this flexible data plan is that, especially with or in the ML context, the ML machines and ML algorithms work really well when you can actually identify the right feature set. And then those feature set can actually change over time, depending on what kind of optimization goals you have and what kind of input data you have. This flexible data plane can be actually considered a high-speed but very flexible feature generator. And you, you can keep redefining your own feature set. So it could be anything like, you know, per packet, uh, say, packet in inter-packet gaps or packet size distribution or Q depth uh, measured at every packet or in-to-out latency. Um, almost anything that you can think of can be generated by this, uh, these machines. Maybe one last question, and then I, I'll hand this over to Vipin. So the next question uh, by Raj is, some big cloud networks um, don't prefer doing anything, any maybe compute acceleration things in network with programmable switches. And, and they, the issue that they uh, see is that, um, you know, they sometimes cannot quickly debug or log and monitor the data plane logic. and, and um, so how do you think the adoption of in-network approach? That's a really great question. So I think we should decouple in-network approach from the, um, so in the, in the Topino's case, you could decide to put Topino as an in-network device, or you could still use Topino as end host, but it's an accelerated framework or platform that can complement, say, x86 or GPUs. So the second approach doesn't require you to put Tofino actually in the network as a switch slash accelerator at the same time. So this, you can think of it as a special Tofino based servers, which happen to have much thicker network interface because it can handle, you know, terabps of network workloads, but you can think of them as special servers. So that's probably going to be the first approach that they're going to take to accelerate some of the compute, but also I.O. intensive workloads uh, and, and by taking advantage of this programmable data plane. 